Welcome everybody. Um, it's nice to be with you here and this is a great day to be thinking about uh, the parks and forests you want to explore uh, this coming year. Um, great day for planning. I don't know how it's been there, but it's been raining here on and off all day and it's been a little bit chilly. So a good time to be thinking about getting outside. Um, my name is Marcy Mowry. I am the president of the Pennsylvania Parks and Forest Foundation. We are not state, the state agency that manages your state parks and state forests. We're a nonprofit arm that works with all of the state parks and state forests. And our mission is to inspire stewardship of Pennsylvania's state parks and state forests. So let me keep moving here. And, and Kelly, what I'm realizing is, is that the, the polling opportunity disappears when I have the screen on. So I may ask you to, when it's time for them, I will ask you to, to post them. No problem. Great. Um, one of the things that we do as a foundation is we organize friends groups. These are volunteer groups that are sprinkled throughout the Commonwealth. And on this slide, you'll see that the ones in green are actually the chapters of the Pennsylvania Parks and Forest Foundation. There are now 47 of those. And the ones are in blue are independent friends groups. So these are, these are volunteers like yourself that are engaged in um, stewarding the state park or state forest with which they have a relationship. And we're fortunate in Pennsylvania. We have a vast network of parks and forests. And before I dive into them a, a little bit deeper, uh, one of the polling questions that I have, and I'm gonna ask Kelly to, to, sh to share that is, how many of our parks and forests have you visited? So Kelly, if you can post that question. And if you see that up there, you can answer it. Uh, zero, one to five, six to 10, 11 to 20, or more than 21. All right, we'll give you a couple more seconds here. Okay. Excellent. So we see many of you have been to at least between one and five of our state parks and state forests. Um, we have a vast network in Pennsylvania. We have 121 state parks. So if you've been to one to five, there's still more to visit. Um, those of you who've been to 11 to 20, you've been to about a, a sixth of them. Um, for those of you who haven't been to any, hopefully at the end of this presentation, you'll be motivated to, to get out and visit one of the parks near you and we'll be talking about those. So we can take that, I can take that down. Great. It should be gone, yep. yep. So there's a lot of different opportunities for engaging in our parks and forests. And we just finished winter. And one of the, the, the comments I get from our park managers on a regular basis is that people oftentimes think that parks close after Labor Day and they open Memorial Day, but really your state parks and state forests are open year round. Um, and one of the things that makes us stand out from many other states is our parks and forests are free admission and free camping. So there is no entrance fee to get into a, a state park or a state forest in Pennsylvania. And that's by design. We want people to be able to get out and enjoy their parks and forests. So let's talk a little bit more about them. I mentioned we have 121 state parks. We also have 2.2 million acres of state forest land in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania that's yours to enjoy. There's over 6,000 community parks. There are rail trails and there are water trails. And all of these amenities are free to you to get out and visit. And interestingly, when we interview people about why they visit a park or a forest, stress reduction is the number one thing that people give as to why they get out to visit a park or forest. And it's true. I was talking to uh, a Dr. Zook today who's with um, Geisinger Health, and he's really is spending a lot of time talking to people about why they would wanna spend time in the outdoors. And stress reduction is one of those reasons. Improving your health is another reason that, that uh, it's important to be spending time in the outdoors because being outside can help to reduce your blood pressure, can help to reduce your risk of heart disease. Can, if you're moving in the outdoors, it can reduce uh, arthritis symptoms. So there are a lot of benefits to, to being outdoors. But that leads me to my second poll question. Uh, Kelly, and that is what motivates you to spend time in the outdoors? So Kelly's gonna post that. Okay. 
it's fun to watch. They're jumping all over the place. It is fun, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> all right, we've got about 62% of you voting. Let's see if we can get to 70. Well, oh, there's 70. All right, last chance. All right, here's our results. Here we go. Well, exercise is in the lead. It's not in the lead by much. Spending time with family and friends is up there, relieving stress and improving the overall health. And during the pandemic, we really saw this. We had a 26% growth in visitors to our parks and forests. 26% to parks alone meant that we went from about 36, 37 million visitors in 20. 19 to over 45 million visitors in 2021. That's tremendous, tremendous growth. And my husband and I, we serve as campground hosts uh, on the weekends. He, during the week, he's retired. I go out on the weekends and we found that one of the major reasons people were coming out was that it was a safe place to connect with family and friends. And they were, people were out there um, engaging in the outdoors, getting their exercise, but more importantly, they were connecting with, with people they hadn't been able to spend time with during the pandemic. Well, the number one form of recreation in Pennsylvania is walking. Really easy to do. You don't need any special equipment um, and you can do it just by walking out your door. But you have some opportunities to explore beyond your door and where you live in Royersford. But let's talk a little bit about the benefits of walking. Um, the benefits of walking are a lot like some of the benefits we just talked about a minute ago. It helps control your sugar levels if you have diabetes, helps to manage high blood pressure, helps to strengthen your bones as a weight bearing exercise, it improves your circulation, it, it reduces stress. If you're outside, it's exposing you to vitamin D, which your body needs that it can make from the sunlight can help to improve your quality of sleep, um, reduce the risk of pain related to arthritis. So there are a lot of benefits just everyday walking. And I recently came across a new form of walking called Nordic walking. And I, I just bought some poles. It's kind of like Nordic or cross country skiing without the skis. And um, I haven't perfected it yet. I've had a lot of people come up to me and say, what are you doing? <laughs> because I look a little silly, um, but, I, but I'm hoping to, to, to master it. And it uses the trekking poles that reduces some of the stress on your knees and moves it so that 90% of your muscles are working as part of your walking regime. So one of the places I believe that's closest to you is Evansburg State Park. And there are a lot of opportunities for walking there and maybe some of you do. Um, boardwalks, trails, um, a little bit further afield, but um, Oops, let's keep going. These came in is French Creek State Park. And I put this picture in. This is actually my nephew who was a reluctant walker. But if I would take him disc golfing at any of the disc golf course we have across the Commonwealth, he would get out there and he would walk for hours. But to him, he was playing disc golf. He wasn't walking. But in actuality, for me, he was walking. But there are some amazing places to walk at French Creek State Park, which is where the disc golf course is. And walking isn't the only thing that you can do in our state parks and state forests. You know, they're, they inspire photography. And this is a picture from our annual photo contest. They inspire poetry. There is bird watching, wildlife watching, canoeing, kayaking, angling, um, bicycling, camping. And we'll talk a little bit about more of some of the other things that you can do. Norristown Farm Park is another place that has some great paved walking areas where you can really um, explore the area. And that is considered to be a state park, but it's actually managed by Norristown. And then down here in the, in the lower right corner is, is, is a, a picture of one of our state forest roads. And recreational driving is actually in the top three types of activities that Pennsylvanians like to engage in, in terms of ex exploring and connecting with the outdoors. And there are many beautiful roads with just a little bend and you keep thinking, I'm just gonna walk or I'm gonna drive up around this bend and then I'll stop. And then there'll be another bend with a little bit of light urging you further on. And a great opportunity to um, see wildlife and feel the benefits of being in the, in the forest. Tyler State Park has a lot of um, opportunities for walking and bicycling. 
And then down here in the lower right hand corner is the Pennsylvania Grand Canyon. I don't know if any of you have been there. That is uh, consists of two state forests, Tioga State Forest and Tyodotton State Forest, uh, Leonard Harrison State Park and Colton Point State Park. And if you see, you see the, the Pine Creek River um, there and just along to the right of that, you see a trail and that's the Pine Creek Rail Trail, which is a, I believe it's like 62 mile walking and bicycling trail. That's a really nice opportunity to explore the Grand Canyon of Pennsylvania. I like this quote by Brene Brown, and I don't know if you've read any of her books. I'm sure the library has some of them. Um, and one of the things that she says is that it takes courage to say yes to rest and play in a culture where exhaustion is seen as a status symbol. And this, Kelly, seems like a great time to put up our next polling question. What prevents you from going out and experiencing your state parks and state forest? They were just at about 62%. Let's see if we can hit up oh, there's 70. There's 70. Excellent. Excellent. So lack of time. That's a very common um, reason that if people give for not um, experiencing a state park or state forest. Um, maybe we can touch on, a, on ways to, to address that because we're fortunate in Pennsylvania that we have a state park within 25 miles of every resident of the Commonwealth. And that was by design. Maurice Goddard is considered to be the father of the Pennsylvania park system. And he wanted to place a state park within 25 miles of every resident. And he did that because he knew it was beneficial for people to spend time in the outdoors. We also have state forests spread throughout the Commonwealth. Even in southeastern Pennsylvania, there is the William Penn Forest District where there are, I believe now, nine tracts of land um, that they hold that are easy and free to explore. Um, lack of information. We'll be talking about some of the places that you can get that information. Um, transportation can be a barrier to getting outdoors. And in which case, you know, I also, many of us live near a community park and those are also very good places to explore. Um, fear, we can talk a little bit about that. And I'm, maybe if you wanna put in the chat box what the other reasons are that prevent you, we can talk about them later when Kelly shares some of the information and from the chat box. Great, thank you for sharing. Well, we do recommend play. Play is a lot of fun and it, play is important no matter how old we are or how young we are at, at heart. And um, this is on the Laurel Highlands hiking trail, which I've never snowshoed. I do like to snowshoe, but it's a wonderful um, backpacking trail and cross-country skiing trail in the in Somerset and um, Cambria counties. So let's talk about finding new places because there are a lot of opportunities and um, maybe you'd like to explore farther afield than, than your local state parks or your, your community parks. Uh, this picture is taken at Heiner View State Park. Heiner View State Park is in Clinton County and that water body you see behind the, the pictures, the people, is the western branch of the Susquehanna River. And Heiner View is a Civilian Conservation Corps era park. It's basically known for its view and for the uh, Intrepid, it is also a, um, a um, hang gliding launch. And if you're up there on a good day, you might catch people hang gliding off of the launch. We have other really unique places to see. Uh, we have an elk herd in Pennsylvania, and that is not something that everybody knows. Uh, the elk are in, in the section of Pennsylvania that we call the PA Wilds. It's everything north of Route 80, um, west of the Pennsylvania Grand Canyon, and east of about Clearfield. But it's a fairly large elk herd, and there are opportunities for visiting the elk, particularly uh, during September and early October when they're in the rut. Um, there is a visitor center at the Elk Country Visitor Center where you can go and learn more about the elk and their habits. 
We have an international dark sky park in Pennsylvania, which is Cherry Springs State Park. That is in um, Potter County. It is some of the darkest skies east of the Mississippi River. And people come from all over the world to see the Milky Way and constellations that you don't typically see when you're in an area where there's light pollution. I live in the Harrisburg area and we don't see nearly the same amount of stars as if, if you go to where you don't have that light pollution. And Cherry Springs is a destination park in the Commonwealth. And then we also have over here on the left is, is a little bit of a waterfall, which is Ricketts Glen State Park. Now, Ricketts Glen is, I believe it's um, not Sullivan County, but it's just west of Wilkes-Barre. It has 26 named waterfalls, and it was actually slated to be a national park. It is that beautiful. And when World War II broke out, um, there wasn't enough funding to purchase it for a national park system, so Pennsylvania made it a state park. So just some very unique opportunities right here in Pennsylvania. So if you're looking for information, one of the places that you can find it is on our website. Um, and we're going to share these uh, URLs with you um, after the program. But on our website, we have um, our newsletter, which will give you ideas of places to go. We've produced a couple of pocket travel guides and we've explored uh, we produce what's called Explore Near Flyers. And I'm gonna show one of those, show you one of those right now. Uh, the Explore Near Flyer were put together because when we talk to people, some people are intimidated about visiting a state park or state forest, or when you get to a park or forest, where do you start if you've not been there before? And so what we did is when we're, when we're doing programs, we would say, you know, okay, we're doing a program in Carlisle, what things can people do you know, within 30 miles of Carlisle? And then we put down some of our ideas of places that you can explore. And we have these for places all over Pennsylvania. So if you go in onto our website, you can download these and they'll give you some ideas of where to start. And so here's the Explore Near Carlisle. You know, it might suggest that you go to Pine Grove Furnace State Park. And Pine Grove Furnace is known for its beach. As you can see there in the background, it's known for fishing. It's known for its history. And it's also surrounded by the Michaux State Forest, which also has a lot of history, including a Civilian Conservation Corps um, camp that was also a prisoner of war camp during World War II. And there's a self-guided walking tour there. So if you like history, we have that in our state parks and state forests as well. The other thing that we have on, our, on that website are some fact sheets on if you're thinking about trying a new type of outdoor activity. And in this example, we give cross-country skiing. So we'll say, okay, if you're thinking about cross-country skiing, maybe not the best example now is that we're getting into summer, um, here are some things that you need to think about. Here's how to get started. And we'd also say, here are some places that you can go. And one of the things that we've been doing in some of the parts of Pennsylvania where we have more regular amounts of snow we've purchased some cross-country skis, such as at Susquehannock State Forest, where you can actually go and you can borrow skis and try it out before you invest in it. And there's a picture of somebody enjoying a cross-country skiing trip. It's important, important to familiarize yourself before you go. Um, this is Fowler's Hollow State Park. This is in Perry County. Um, Fowler's Hollow is a small park. Uh, this is actually where my husband and I have been campground hosting. It's completely surrounded by the Tuscarora State Forest. But people show up here and they're thinking that uh, they'll be able to use their cell phone. They're looking for a shower. This is primitive camping at this campground. <laughs> there are 18 sites, 12 RV sites, uh, six walk-in tent sites. And then there, there's just a lot, of, a lot, lot of wilderness surrounding it. So it's important to read a little bit about the, the place you're thinking about you want, want to explore so that you understand if it meets the, your needs. Um, this is if you like horseback riding, this has miles and miles of horseback riding opportunities. Another way to familiarize yourself with the parks or forests or activities that you'd like to try is that many of our parks and forests have concessionaires where you can rent equipment and give it a try. This is Marsh Creek State Park. Um, it has uh, 
paddleboarding as one of your opportunities or sailboating. So, and kayaking and canoeing. But if you're thinking that paddleboarding might be something that you wanna try, go and rent one. Have them give you some tips, try it out before you make the investment. Many of our friends groups host festivals and events. They were on hiatus in 2020, but they're starting to be planned again as, as restrictions lift. And uh, on the left is a Native American powwow at Shikolimi State Park, which is in, uh, right on the, the uh, main stem of the Susquehanna River. And I believe the picture on the right is Black Mishannon State Park, and that is a um, ice Olympics, and they're, they're playing golf on the ice there. <laughs> So it's a great way to learn the park, meet people that know the park, ask questions, and interact with it in a different way. We often recommend it if you're going out to explore is to know your needs and know your limits. If you need special equipment, check with the park. They may have that equipment available. Um, this is an adaptive kayak that we place. And if you have balance challenges, we have adaptive kayak launches in a number of our parks now that helps to stabilize a boat. So if you want to get in and out of the water, it makes it much, much easier. Um, get this to move. Perhaps you are looking for something more adventurous like mountain biking. You know, there are those opportunities, but there are very different levels of mountain biking. So, you know, know what you, what your challenge is. I do not do fire towers. Um, and there are a couple of places with fire towers. This is a Cook Forest State Park where it's open to the public. You can walk to the top. You will never see me at the top of a fire tower. That's my limitation. <laughs> I'm happy to stand on the edge of a cliff and look down. I'm happy to climb, uh, but I'm not, I, I do not do fire towers. This is at Ohio Pile State Park. I love to whitewater raft and whitewater kayak, but this is beyond my limits. And so, you know, we saw it last year, people taking risks that maybe they needed a little bit more experience to do. And that puts everybody in danger. So really know what your limitations are before you set out on an, an adventure. Another way to explore a park or a forest is to volunteer and a lot of opportunities exist to do that. And then you're meeting up with people that, that know that place and can give you some ideas and some tips as well. So we had fear as one of, the, one of the concerns, and there are some steps that you can take to reduce your risk when you're spending time in the outdoors. And one of those is to not go alone. Um, it is safe to be out by yourself, but whether you're traveling with somebody or traveling alone, one of the things that we highly recommend is you tell somebody where you're going. You let them know where you're going and when you plan to be back. That way, if you don't come back at the time, let's say you fell, um, they'll know where to go and look. Or I used to call a friend and I'd say, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw my kayak in here. I plan to pull out here by four o'clock. If you don't hear from me, I may have stopped to get something to eat. Call me first, because I may have forgotten, but then they know where I am. And that's really important, no matter it's if you're traveling with somebody or by yourself, let somebody know where you're going and when you plan to be back. Make sure that you have the right equipment. Even if you're out for a day hike, it's good to have a, a little pack with a first aid kit in it, some water, maybe some snacks. Um, have the, the equipment that you need for the job that you're doing or the activity that you're doing. Always good to have a first aid kit. And always, no matter what time of year it is, make sure that you stay hydrated. Because even in the winter, you can get dehydrated. And when you're dehydrated, you start making bad decisions or you, start, um, you can start to stumble and simple as saying, I went and got a glass of water before the program started. Because even if you're sitting at home, it's very important to stay hydrated. If you're, you're setting up camp, it's so much easier to set up camp if it's not dark. Um, and always keep an eye out for the weather. I don't know if you got the storm we got here yesterday. We had the most unusual thunderstorm. And it, it sounded like an old, like a 1930s radio show where they're faking thunder where they're like, they're like bouncing sheets of metal. I, it, it's just the most unusual storm. And I was thinking to myself, I'm glad I'm not out in that. <laughs> but keep an eye on the weather because it can change pretty quickly. 
there's a, a philosophy of spending time in the outdoors called leave no trace. And you may have heard this because one of the things that we say is take only pictures, uh, leave only footprints. And one of the things that we found during the, the pandemic is with the uptick in visitors, there was an increase in, in, the, in, in the, the volume of, of litter that was left behind. So we really try to encourage people to make sure that anything that you take in with you, you bring back out. And that you don't take things, you don't take um, feathers that you find on the ground, birds nests, um, plants that you pick, you take only, only the pictures and the memories of your experience. Another part of the leave no trace is, is to, not, to not disturb wildlife. And we have a wide variety of wildlife in our parks and forests, whether from the, the, the cute little chipmunk up to some of the raptors that we've reintroduced. Um, but if you find that your, your actions are disturbing them, for in this case, if you're getting too close to some raptors, the osprey with your kayak, back up and, and don't disturb them. Enjoy them from a distance because there's a lot that you can see and learn just by sitting quietly and observing wildlife. And the other thing with safety, and this is Isabel, she's, she's my, my pup, is that Pennsylvania is a hunting state. And you know, there are parts, times of the year where that you're sharing the outdoors with hunters. And so it's always good practice to have some level of, of a bright collar on so that you're visible to others in the, in the park or forest. And 80% of our parklands are open to hunting and all of our state forests are open to hunting. So this is a map of our parks and forests. Um, there are 20 forest districts that compromise your 2.2 million acres. Um, you live in District 17, and you can see down there in the Southeast Pennsylvania, that's the William Penn Forest District. And there you can see the, the triangles are the 121 state parks. And there's a lot of opportunities. And when I was talking earlier, I talked about Leonard Harrison and Colton Points. I don't know if you can see my cursor. That's up here in the northern part of the state. That's where the Pennsylvania Grand Canyon is. Not far from that here is, can you see my cursor? Mm -hmm. It's Cherry Springs State Park. That's where you found the darkest skies east of the Mississippi River. Um, we mentioned French Creek and Norris, at Evansburg and Norristown. Pine Grove Furnace is over here in Cumberland County. Fowler's Hollow is right here. It's part of the Colonel Denning complex. We have, we have two different groupings of, of state parks. We have what we call the Civilian Conservation Corps parks, which Colonel Denning and Fowler's Hollow are. French Creek is a mixture. It was originally built by the Civilian Conservation Corps. And if you don't understand what that is when I say it, this was back in the 1930s to the 1940s. These were young men ages 17 to 24 who were out of work and um, they were given jobs helping to rebuild the natural environment of Pennsylvania. So they built a lot of our state parks. They built a lot of our state forests. They built, built trails, dams, they replanted the trees, they fought wildfires. Um, so those are our older parks. And then we have what we call the Goddard era parks and um, Nakamixon State Park would be a Goddard era park. And many of these have very large lakes because um, Maurice Goddard said that a state park without a lake is like apple pie without cheddar cheese. So <laughs> try it sometime, it's actually quite good. So it, you know, it really has, that's one of the defining characteristics but French Creek is both a Goddard park and a CCC era park. Ohio Pile, which is where you saw the whitewater rafter, uh, whitewater kayaker, that's all the way over here. And it's known for its, its fast, wa fast moving waters. It's also part of the Great Allegheny Passage, which is a rail trail, if you like to bicycle, that goes all the way from Point State Park in Pittsburgh down into Maryland and connects to the CNO Canal and goes all the way to, to Washington, DC. So it's a very long trail. And then Presque Isle State Park is our only inland beach. One of the tools that we have for helping to explore our parks and forests is the Pennsylvania State Park and State Forest Passport. 
And this is a, a book that lists all 121 state parks in the 20 forest districts and gives you a little bit of information about them. And then when you visit, you can stamp it. Um, in addition to that, we have it grouped thematically. So if you're an angler and you like to fish, these are the places we recommend fishing. If you're traveling with children, these are the parks where you might have a, a you know, opportunities for short hikes with children. Uh, if you like to bicycle, if you like to picnic, or you like places of quiet contemplation. So we recommend based on the thematics of how we think people might like to interact with their parks. So you might be saying, this is all well and good, Marcy. You know, I, I like this, but I don't tent anymore. I don't want to sleep on the ground. And I'm here to tell you that you have other opportunities. This is the Nature Inn at Bald Eagle State Park. This is just outside of State College, outside of Penn State. It is a 16 room inn or bed and breakfast um, that will serve you a wonderful breakfast. You'll stay in a modern room overlooking a lake. And um, it's a great place for bird watching if you like bird watching. So we have a whole variety of opportunities for overnight accommodations. This is a yurt. We have a number of, of state parks with yurts. A yurt is a Mongolian tent, um, has a wooden frame, which is enveloped with canvas. And here's a little sneak peek inside of the yurt. There are beds, there's kitchen table, there's stove and refrigerator. So it's like a little cabin. So it's a really interesting and fun experience to stay in a yurt. We have rustic cabins such as these at, um, I believe this is Black Machanan State Park. And we have modern cabins. And for your distinction, a rusty cabin means that it will have all the comforts of home except running water. You will have to go to the bathhouse for that. And a modern cabin includes the plumbing inside the cabin. So if you're looking at staying at a state park or state forest, um, a rustic cabin will not have indoor plumbing, a modern cabin will. So it'll have a kitchen with running water, a bathroom, a shower, etc. cetera. Christy, could you share the name of the inn that was outside of Penn State one more time? That's the Nature Inn at Bald Eagle State Park. Great, thank you. I don't know if anybody has visited this unique opportunity in Pennsylvania. This is Kinzu Bridge State Park. At one time, it was the longest and tallest viaduct in the world, a viaduct being a, a bridge for trains. And a number of years ago, an F1 tornado came through and took out the center span. You can sort of see the spans that tumbled laying down here on the ground. So the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, which is the agency that manages your state parks and state forests, put their heads together and they said, let's turn um, lemons into lemonade. And what they did is if you can, can barely see it here, it kind of juts out. This is now a promenade that walks out to an overlook with a glass bottom. And you can walk out on, on this and it's almost as though you're flying. So you get a beautiful view of the Kinzu Valley. There's a wonderful visitor center here uh, with this experience. And then there's also the opportunity to walk out on the skywalk. I was there recently in March, a lot of activity going on. Two years ago when I was there, there were people, visitors from South Carolina who drove up because they had heard about this experience. So it's become very popular, particularly in the fall when the leaves are changing. Because think about the view that you could get of the leaves standing on that skywalk. I mentioned Presque Isle as our inland beach. Uh, this is Presque Isle State Park, which is a peninsula into Lake Erie. Um, great place and not too far from Presque Isle is Erie Bluffs State Park, which is one of the largest undeveloped stretches of the Erie coastline. So it's almost like stepping back in time and getting, getting a glimpse of what the coastline would have looked like before the, the buildings were placed. This is Susquehannock State Forest. And I just love this picture in part because it, it reminds me of awe, A-W-E. And when we can have moments of awe, they've found that researchers have found that it increases our creativity and it reduces our stress. And even if you're not sitting there on that bench watching that sunset, 
looking at that picture and imagining yourself sitting on that bench, watching that sunset could have the same health benefits. And I find that when my day, I actually have this, this picture hanging up in my office, at my office, not my home office. And when I find that I'm getting stressed, all I have to do is look at this picture and I feel a little bit better. This is Hickory Run State Park. Um, has any, I don't know if anybody has visited this. This is up in the Poconos. It's known for its boulder field. And you know people like to visit this geologic wonder. It's a national natural landmark. Some people like to explore it and some people just like to sunbathe on it. <laughs> so that's a quick overview. Um, what I'd like to do, I find it much easier to answer questions than to um, think about all the information that you might like to glean. So if you'd like to post some questions or if you'd like to share some of your concerns and we can talk about those as well, I am happy to do that speak to those. Um, one of the comments that I did get when you were asking why people don't visit that we hadn't mentioned, um, one of them was that they didn't always have someone to go with. Um, but I did notice you talking about going and volunteering, which seems like a great way to go and meet other people that also enjoy the park system. Yes, and it, on our website, there is a calendar and the calendar of events will tell you what's happening at the parks nearest you or the parks that you want to explore. So there might be a, a, a lecture happening or a walk. Um, so you maybe if you've walked the trail before, you'd feel more comfortable. Um, if, if walking is what you want to do, if, if you paddled it, if, you're, if paddling is of your interest, um, or you can volunteer and you'll get to meet the people that are going there regularly. I sometimes, Oftentimes I will recreate alone. And what I do is I tend to choose places that are more popular. So that way if I don't feel isolated. So I'll take a popular trail and I'll walk on that trail or uh, I'll paddle in a lake where there are a lot of other people paddling or even camping alone. I will camp, but I will, I will find a place. I tend to camp near families with grandchildren because they'll keep an eye out for you. <laughs> Some of my little tips. And there are also hiking clubs. There are bicycling clubs. So depending on what your interest is, there might be a club that you can join that has organized opportunities. Um, if bird watching is, is to your liking, there might be a bird club or an Audubon chapter. So you know, depending on what your activity is, you, if you do a little research, you might find a group of people that are already engaging in it that would welcome you to be a part of their group as part of their field trips or outings. Got a couple more things coming in here on my side. Um, someone is concerned about people not social distancing enough, um, as that seems to be the case everywhere that they're going right now, um, especially with young children. Do you feel like that's something that the parks enable you to? I, I see it from, from both sides. Um, there are places where you can get your social distance. Um, there are other trails or, or boat launches or places where it bottlenecks and it's difficult to social distance. So that's one of the reasons I think, think it's important to, what we could say no before you go. Um, and there are a couple of videos on our YouTube channels that speak to this. So if you get to a park or a forest, the first thing that I recommend is, is picking up a map. And we oftentimes go to what we know. So if we go to a park and we know we've always heard of X trail, we're gonna call it the Kelly trail. And you get there and the Kelly trail is, is, is packed. Is there a second trail that you can go to where you'll have just as a positive as experience, but there'll be fewer number of people. And when we talked about Pine Grove, there's a, there's a trail there. It's um, not the Flat Rock, it just went, oh, it just went out of my head. Everybody goes there, Pulse Steeple. Everybody goes to Pulse Steeple, but there are a lot of other trail opportunities. So if people would just pick up a map first, they would find other opportunities. So sometimes you have to make your own social distancing because there are, there are people that won't um, respect that desire for social distancing. And the best way to do that is to make sure that you have more than one place mapped out 
when you visit a, a park or a forest where you can go. Have a plan B. Great, and that actually goes perfectly with my next question. Um, someone wants to know, do you have any good resources for trail maps, maybe something good for mobile devices? <sighs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm gonna disturb my dog for a second here. Who again thinks she's getting a, a treat. <laughs> <laughs> so some of the best trail maps that are being produced right now, they're not mobile, is a, these are the purple lizard maps. Um, they have a whole host of these. We sell these on our website. You can buy them from purple lizard. A lot of the, the retail outfitters are selling them as well. They are very, very detailed maps, um, but more detailed than the state park and state forest maps. So this is one that I would recommend. All Trails tends to be a good um, online piece, but in terms of, of an app for our parks and forests, we're not really there yet in Pennsylvania. And it's one of the things that we're exploring because we know that um, the technology is there and our counterparts in Florida have an, an, an app now where it, shows your car and you can, wherever you're hiking, you know where you are in relation to ship to where you parked. So there's a lot of technology that we can implement. We just haven't gotten to that point to implement it yet. But the visitor maps at a park, those are helpful. This is Buchanan's birthplace. Um, they all look a little bit different, Little Pine, but then, you know, a detailed map such as the Pine Creek and the, um, loyal stuff there are a lot of different ones made by purple lizard maps and, and they're really detailed they revise these every two years or so so they're constantly checking them and they go out and they walk all of the trails to make sure that they're accurate terrific um, and they're waterproof and they're rip proof so you can't do anything to them <laughs> <laughs> if there was one thing that you needed to be waterproof and rip proof that's definitely one of them. that's it that's your map you know, and we also have water trails in Pennsylvania. You know, you have the Schuylkill River Trail, the Delaware River, Susquehanna. There's a lot of river trails and there's some good maps for that if, if you want to explore the uh, kayak or canoe, some of the places in the landscape. And we have 83,000 miles of rivers and streams in Pennsylvania. So there's a lot to explore. Um, is Peace Valley Park in New Britain one of the state parks? That is a community park. Mm, okay. And are all of the parks open now and their facilities, restrooms, um, pavilions, all of that? All of that is open. Pavilions um, tend to be reservable. If you arrive and it's not reserved, you can utilize it. But if you arrive and it's, it's been reserved by somebody, then you know, you'd have to find another pavilion. Mm -hmm. We have 30,000 picnic tables in our state park system. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to find a picnic if that's, that's what you're seeking to do. Um, restrooms are open. Even during the winter months, there's usually at least one restroom open, normally near the office. Um, but our parks are open. They never close. Um, they're open from dawn to dusk, um, unless you're spending the night, um, in which case you can be there overnight. And if you're angling on the water, you can be there after dawn and dusk because some of the best fishing is during those time periods. Great. Is there a one-stop shop for booking modern accommodations at the various parks or do you have to go park by park? There is a, um, on the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources website, there is a reservation. And if you don't do the internet, um, let me put my glasses on. There is a 1888 number. And that is the one-stop shop for making your reservation. So I am going to hope that they have it here on this. Okay, it's 888-727-2757. Or you can vi uh, go www.visitpaparks.com. And that'll take you to the, the website online to make reservations. Many of our, um, our state park cabins are pet friendly. Many of our campsites are pet friendly. Um, so there are, are opportunities if you're looking to travel with your pets as well. Great, and someone wants to know about the picture that you're currently showing us. Is that 
a bed and breakfast or is that a historic site? This is McConnell's Mill State Park. This is um, just north of Pittsburgh. It is a historic mill that um, is not grinding right now, but you can go in and, and tour the mill and it's good for fishing. There are rock climbers there and there are whitewater kayakers and it is, it is a very beautiful park. Uh, highly recommend it if you find yourself in the Pittsburgh area, it's just north of Pittsburgh um, to visit that. But we do have some accommodations that are in older buildings. Um, sometimes we call them lodges. Um, Laurel Hill State Park has the Hoffman Lodge, which I think sleeps about 15 people. So it's a great place if you're having a family reunion. Um, RV Winter State Park has one. And oftentimes these tend to be old homes that have been on the property and they've converted them into places where families can stay. Um, there is a, a good handout and I'm wondering, I bet we can scan it and put it up on our website that kind of explores some of those unique lodging opportunities. Um, okay. So I'll make a note to have Pam scan it and put it up on the website and if you visit our website, we'll, it'll be there. So let me put that in there. Terrific, that would be very neat to know. And this picture is stunning. That is the last question that has come across to me. Um, if anyone has anything else to say, type that in now or use that raise hand feature so I can let you speak. Yes, I'd love to answer your questions. I, I've been to all 121 state parks. I've been to all 20 forest districts. When I uh, started in this position 16 years ago, I had been to 87 of the then 114 parks and 17 of the 20 forest districts. So I am a user. I am, I am a park and forest enthusiast and I'm always happy to share my knowledge with you. Um, what's the newest park? Well, the newest state park is actually an older park and it's um, Washington Crossing State Park. It had been a state park and then it became part of the um, Pennsylvania Historic and Museum Commission. And then about four years ago, it came back into the park system. And this is where Washington crossed the Delaware. So not too far from you. Um, if we go just beyond that, it is Erie Bluffs. And that's that park outside of Presque Isle that I mentioned that is the longest, longest undeveloped stretch of Lake Erie shoreline. That was our, our newest park until Washington Crossing came back into the system. I was there a couple of years ago, right when spring was hitting. And there were still these icebergs, like these ice chunks that were floating across Erie. Yeah. And I see them way out, but it was like two different worlds on the water and on the land. So cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which I see someone is raising their hand, Kathleen McCoy, as her. Oh, sure. Go ahead, Kathleen. Let me see if I can hit that there. For some reason, it's not showing me. Go ahead. I should be giving you permission now. Can you unmute yourself, Kathleen? I just have a comment. Um, I've heard so many um, stories about Cherry Springs State Park. And I said to my husband, we have to go. And we went um, right before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. It was incredible. It was so wonderful. The people were from all over. And um, I had an amateur um, astronomer there and she had this small telescope that she's had for 30 years. And she explained the stars and we saw the Milky Way. Amazing. It was the best. Yes. So I think because I didn't, I go to some state parks but I didn't realize that they were free. That's wonderful. Yeah, we're one of only, I believe, six or eight states that have a free system. Uh, wonderful. I you love the state it. parks. Excellent. So thank Excellent. you. Thank You're you. Welcome. Thank you. Marcy, do you have a favorite state park? I, I don't really. I, I, I tell people it's kind of like choosing which child you like the best. <laughs> And out of um, hundred, how can you choose? Yes, yes. And it really, they all have different qualities and provide a different experience that, that speak to me. 
you know, I visit um, uh, Black Michan and quite a bit that's outside of State College as well. And that just has a very different ecosystem. It's more like being in Canada. I've been caught in snow. I've been snowed in there at the foot of snow, you know, at the end of March, <laughs> you know, so it's a very different environment. But, you know, then, you know, for nice flat water paddling, I might go to Cadoras or, I, you know, knock a mix in. So it really varies depending on what I want to do. And, um, you know, the day. Yeah. So I, I don't, you know, so there's a park very close to us. It's a small park, but it has a really intricate trail system. So I can go there and I can hike for 15 minutes or I can loop these trails together and I can spend five hours hiking there. And it's only 20 minutes from my house. So that's the closest one for me. There's a park, a route and activity for every mood. There truly there is. Mm -hmm. And we have forested islands in the Susquehanna right here where we can go and camp. And those are 10 minutes from my door and I can be on an island in my, in my tent, looking at the state capitol but sleeping in the outdoors under the trees. That's so neat. Yeah. <laughs> I did not know that was a thing. Um, are you familiar with the rules for hunting? Um, are they supposed to stay away from people that are walking and partaking in recreational activities? Because someone mentions that they've had some times where they were a little nervous seeing hunters hanging around more public areas. In the, in the more public areas, um, it's, it typically is a safety zone, um, typically within like 300, I think it's 300 yards, I have to double check that, where there, there's not to be hunting activity. Mm -hmm. On a map, and this, I don't have a good map here, it will show you where the safety zones are, where hunting is not allowed. So if you're concerned about hunting, then I would recommend looking at the map, um, and seeing where the safety zones zones are. Um, let me see here. So like in this one, this one's kind of hard to see. You see the lighter colors? Mm -hmm. Those are the safety zones. So there's no hunting in those. And then the darker greens on the outskirts, hunting is permitted there. And if at any point you feel that you're in an area and somebody shouldn't be there, then by, you know, by all means go to the park office or, or talk to the ranger and express your concerns. Okay. Um, is there anything that you might need to know before going to a state park that spans a border into another state? Wow, that's a very good question. You know, and, and one that pops into my head immediately is White Clay Creek Preserve, which is in Southern Chester County. And in Pennsylvania, it's free. And you can hike there, but you can't mountain bike. But if you went to Delaware, you can mountain bike and I believe there's a fee. Mm. Um, so yes, you know, it is important if, if it's spanning a border to understand what the rules are on both sides. Pima Tuning State Park is another one of those that's on both sides of, you know, in, in Ohio and in Pennsylvania. So the rules might be a little bit different and um, what you're able to participate in may, different, may differ as well. But those are the only two that come to mind that span the border. I mean, obviously, you know, you have the Delaware Canal and there's Canal New Jersey side and the Pennsylvania sides, but they're not the same parks. They're different parks. Um, back to hunting. Is there a season where there's no hunting at all? Or is there always something that you're able to hunt for? I believe crows, coyotes, you know, th there's a couple species that I believe are open at any point in time. Mm. There's spring gobbler, which I just looked up the other day is April 30th until the end of May. That's um, when spring turkey hunting. And then you have archery typically in the early part of fall. And then, you know, deer, you know, black powder archery and then rifle season. So you can look at the Game Commission's website to find out when that is. Mm -hmm. um, currently, Sunday hunting is only allowed on three Sundays in, in Pennsylvania. So Sundays is generally, you know, during the hunting season, a good time to go out. Okay. Um, or, you know, if you're concerned, you know, it's, the, the majority of, of hunting in Pennsylvania is done in the fall. And the seasons vary of where you are and what's in season. So I would say 
check the game commission website if you're visiting an area where that might be a concern mm -hmm. and um and then just practice safety wear orange make noise or stay in the areas that um are safety zones excellent um if you somehow find yourself getting turned around and you know you lost the trail and aren't quite sure how to find your way out what should you do typically if you are really lost the best thing to do is to stop moving because <laughs> uh, <laughs> you can you can if somebody's looking for you you can you, you can be, you make it more difficult if you think that you have you've you veered away a little bit. Um, I would say, you know, cautiously like get your bearings, you know, you have a map, see if there's anything on the map that would lend itself to helping you to understand, you know, maybe you're looking at your map and you see that there's a, a big rock outcropping and you can see the rock outcropping and maybe that'll help you orient yourself. Um, I, I think that, if you're hiking in unfamiliar areas, you know, many of our, our park trails are well marked. Make sure that you're following the trail. And if I say a blaze, um, hopefully you know what I mean. And I don't have a picture of a blaze. Uh, a blaze is, is, a, is a tree, a, a tree or a, a piece of wood that's painted with a, a slash of color. And that's an indication that you're on, on, a, on a given trail. And you want to keep those blazes in your 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 vision when you're hiking because that's going to guide you to where you need to be. Occasionally, you'll end up, you know, you might see a trail that's going off, and if you look and you don't see a blaze, that's not a designated trail, and that might then lead you astray. Mm -hmm. And I wish I had a, a quick. Let me stop sharing this screen and I am going to quickly look for a picture of a blaze because I think it's important to know what one is. Let me just see here. That's not good. Hold on. Please hike in. Here we go. Let's show this. I'm going to share again. Okay, so this is a blaze. It's just a painted line on a tree and a straight blaze means you're just following it. If a, a blaze is double stacked and it, the upper one is to the left, that means the trail turns to the left. And if a blaze is, is there's two of them and it's stacked to the right, that means the trail goes to the right. So a blaze is really your way of, of following a trail that it is a designated trail and it's the safest way to hike is to make sure that you have the blaze in your, your field of vision. Mm, let's see, is there a concern for bears in any of the PA parks? There are bears in every county of Pennsylvania. Um, so, you know, we had a bear near camp this a week and a half ago. We didn't actually see him in the, in, the, in the park, but we saw him on our way to the park. And if you're camping, the best way to reduce bear encounters is to keep a clean camp. You know, put your food away, don't leave it out on the picnic table. Uh, and the same thing if, if you're hiking, you know, just make noise. Most animals don't want to encounter you any more than you want to encounter them. And um, oftentimes, you know, I will smell a bear, but it's very rare that I see a bear in all of my hiking. And when I say I smell a bear, you know, they're kind of a musty smell. And you think, oh, a bear must have been through here at some point. But bear encounters are, are very rare. And I think if you stay on designated trails, if, if, you, if you make a lot of noise, they're gonna, they're gonna leave. The only time that there's a, a concern is if you encounter a bear with cubs. And then I would say, you know, back out of the situation, you know, make sure that you don't get in between the, the mother and the cubs mm -hmm. because then a bear will become protective. Is there a certain time of year they tend to be more aggressive? 
They're coming out now and they'll be coming out with, with, with cubs now. Okay. So and they'll, they'll be, um, the last bear I saw up close was in the city of Harrisburg, two blocks from the Capitol. <laughs> it, it, but it, it swam across the river. It must have been a, like a, a, a young bear that was pushed out from the territory. And he was just confused and he climbed up in a tree and he cried and cried, he cried. And the game commission came and relocated him. Oh. Um, but, you know, he didn't want to be in the city any more than the people wanted, wanted him to be there. So, you know, you know, use caution, but I, I also wouldn't let it, let the fear of running into a bear keep you from spending time in the outdoors. Mm -hmm. um, oh, here we go. If it's starting to get dark and you haven't still found your way out yet, then what? This actually happened a few times during impromptu hikes without maps. They're not always at every entrance and was wondering who we could call to help to get us out. That's a good question. So one thing that, that if, if you're gonna be going out on a hike and you think you're gonna be out toward dusk, um, if I'm going out for a longer hike in my day pack, I have, um, I have a flashlight, I have extra water, I have snacks, I have an emergency blanket, I have um, a headlamp more than a flashlight. I have um, everything I need to be comfortable in case I can't get out. Um, you can call 911. The thing that you need to bear in mind is that depending on where you're hiking, there may or may not be cellular reception. Mm -hmm. So you can download maps for all of our parks from online from the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources website. So it is helpful to have a map with you. I would recommend taking a map. Um, if you can see and you're still following the trail, you could continue if you know where you're going, but if you don't know where you're going at that point, I would probably sit down. So moral of the story is always have a map. Always have a map. Physical. A flashlight. Um, yep. <laughs> Great advice. Um, I think that was my last question here. So we're going to make this last call. Um, this was a great Q&A. That was almost a half hour. You guys had some terrific questions. And Marcy, you had answers to every one of them. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, I'm not seeing anything come through here. So if you guys do have any questions, I'm sure you'll be able to find plenty of info in those links that I shared. Um, you'll also get those in your follow-up email this evening. So uh, be able to check that out. And um, other than that, wish you all the best in your gallivanting. And yeah, let's have lots of fun outdoors. Yes. And, and Take, take a peek at our website, the, the next newsletter. We're actually gonna be doing an article on, on recreating in bear country. Uh, so, you know, probably within six weeks that'll be uploaded to our website. And so there'll be some information. Great, I'm sure there's a lot of valuable stuff in there. <laughs> yep. All right, uh, Marcy, thank you so much for coming. You're welcome. Out. It was a great night. And thank you everybody else for coming as well. And we'll hope to see you next time. All right, bye-bye, enjoy. Bye -bye.